Yes, I'm going again. I guess you are. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this evening we're uh, rolling right through uh, John's prologue. I'm going to take a look at verses 15, 16, and 17. Um, last week we just looked at one verse, um, which is 14, because of its, I should say, two weeks ago, not last week. Um, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. I, and that's really kind of the hinge point in the whole prologue. Um, it's the point in which we start talking about um, the Jesus event as the incarnation event. Um, Jesus Christ becoming flesh. Well, I should say the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Jesus hasn't been named yet. His name hasn't come up um, yet. The only name that's been given is the name of John the Baptist. Um, who, uh, again, uh, is different from the author of our book. Uh, John the Baptist is different than John the Evangelist. We have this problem at St. Michael's where we have a thousand people named John. Um, lots of Johns, uh, so you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta be on the lookout for that. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, that, that's the case here as well. And in verse 15, we're back to John the Baptist. Um, so this is really the final section prologue, 15 through 18. Um, so the word is introduced in verses one through five, it's given a witness in verses 6 through 8 um, and made manifest in 9 through 14. So now it shifts to its final section where the uniqueness of the word is explained. Um, so it starts with a reminder in verse 15. Um, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, <coughs> He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And you get that here, uh, again, John, martyrei, the, the, the martyr witnessed, right? That's that same, that same uh, word, um, witness to him, and cried out, kekregen, uh, kekregen, this is cried out, saying, um, uh, he who comes after me, he who comes after me, ranks before me, uh, because he was before me. It's a strange way of putting that. We're gonna say, tell, we're gonna talk about why, why, why it's put that way. So first off, it's a reminder. Um, and interestingly, in the grammar on this, the, the witnessing and the crying out, um, it's both present and perfect tense. So John sort of stands this, as this kind of historical witness, John the Baptist stands as this historical witness as to who Jesus is. John the Baptist is an important historical character in the uh, history of all these events. John the Baptist was known. I mean, we hear that you know, all of Jerusalem came out to be baptized by him. So lots and lots of people came out to be baptized by him. So he's, he's an important person. Um, the only person more important in this whole story is Jesus Christ, of course. Uh, but John would have been known. This would have been someone that, that, that would have been unknown. This would have been a, a very important person, this whole, this whole chain of events. Um, I mean, there's a reason people are asking, is he the Messiah? Is he Elijah? Who is this man that, that, that is driving the people out? And the Pharisees are very wary of him, right? And the religious authorities are very wary of John the Baptist because he's saying very radically that they too need to be clean. Where remember, the, the Pharisaical... Uh, obedience was designed to, you were clean all the time, you didn't need to be more clean. Uh, and, and John was saying that that's not enough to make you clean. It made him a very uh, controversial figure, of course. Um, but who is he testifying to? Uh, again, this, 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 uh, this uh, Ketra again, this word again is cried out word. Um, it's not, this isn't an emotional or a rational crying out. Um, this is a technical term, actually for how a prophet speaks. Um, Jesus will talk of himself crying out, talk about the spirit cries out. Um, Paul would use this in Romans 9 to talk about how Isaiah talks, Isaiah cries out. Again, it's a technical term for what a prophet is doing. Um, not, not sort of like, this isn't, remember the prophets aren't speaking out in kind of nonsense craziness. Um, they're the mouthpieces of God, right? And, and that's what, that's the, that's what, you know, we'd say that John the Baptist is the last Old Testament prophet, right? Um, 
He's in the New Testament, right? He's the last Old Testament prophet. He's the hinge between those two things. Um, and so we get this really interesting thing. We get the first time that we have um, a first-person speech in the, in the gospel uh, where he says, I said, this, uh, uh, this, let go, this I said, right? Um, it's the only time in the prologue a person is introduced as a speaker. Right, so it's the first time we have anybody talking in the prologue, right? And it's John the Baptist. Uh, and what's neat about that is it really is, for John the Evangelist, the moment in which the Old Testament moves into the New Testament, right? Uh, I mean, we talk about John the Baptist as the hinge between old and new. And this is the moment when a prophet, in a sense, becomes an apostle. Uh, instead of just... Um, talking about the one who's coming, he's looking at the one who's coming. So he begins his ministry saying, he's coming, this word is coming, Messiah is coming, and then he ends it by seeing him, right? That's very different from all the other prophets. Uh, that, that's, that makes John very, very unique. Uh, Jesus, Jesus will talk about this, that you know, uh, of all the men born of women, he's, he's, he's the greatest, right? But there's a sense, I mean, that's talking about this, this idea um, that he's, of all the prophets, he's the one who actually gets to see this coming, right? Um, um, that's a huge moment in, 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 in this prologue. It's, it's the movement out of the Old Testament. Particularly when we think about how much of this prologue has been concerned with the world even before the Old Testament, right? The world before the beginning, the world before the creation, that, to establish that the word was even there. Uh, before the Old Testament, right, before the creation. Uh, but he's also intimately involved in that creation, um, and then intimately involved even further by becoming incarnate, by becoming a human being. Right? That, that's the idea here. And so, <laughs> the reason this is written kind of the way it is, he, cut, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Um, it's the Baptist stating unequivocally that his successor, um, is greater than the forerunner because the successor is the true forerunner. I mean, one of the things that John has just beaten on over and over and over again is that it's the, 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 uh, the preeminence, the before everything status of Christ um, that makes him different. Right? Um, he, was with, he was God and was with God before, in the beginning. And he's the source of creation, right? And so for John, that's a, John the Baptist, that, that's why this one who comes after him. Because, you know, normally how this works, even when we think of sort of um, uh, intellectual uh, groupings or the way, anyway, you have sort of a mentor and a mentee. We would think that in this relationship, Jesus would be the mentee and John would be the mentor. John has this big following, this Jesus shows up and he sort of passes the reins down to him, right? That's not the relationship here at all. Um, this is the one who was there from the beginning of the world. The one who knit John together is the one who's come before him, right? That's, that's, the, that's the, what we have to kind of wrap our heads around here. Um, it's kind of the paradox of it. He is both before and after John is the paradox, right? Um, that, 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 John is, that John the evangelist is trying to get in our heads. Um, but this, this relationship, the relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus helps us to understand in kind of a personal, personal way what it means that God, you know, as in 14, he's among us, right? In, in the word is among us and in the beginning with God. How does that work? How is that even possible? Well, we, we can understand it on a personal level when we think about the relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus. It starts to make, we can think about it, we can sort of start to wrap our heads around it in that John the Baptist is the prop, the last Old Testament prophet prophesying the coming one, the Messiah. Um, the Messiah, the coming one who's been there from the beginning, always coming, right? The one who was there, who created the world. He's prophesying about him, and then he comes. Right? So this is the one who is among him, with him, but the one who's been there from the beginning. Um, that, that's, that, that's what this is really trying to stress, because that... We can say we kind of just, okay, I, I'm, I understand, I'm moving on, but really think about that for a second, and that really is, that's a mind bender. Uh, and so you really kind of, you have to start thinking about it kind of a personal
personal level in this, uh, in, in the, what, what this all means. And so John is a pain to try to, John the Evangelist is a pain to truly try to help us understand what all, what all this means, um, uh, what, what, what the Jesus event is about. And so that's really what, what, really what verse 15 is, is all about, is, is reminding us about the relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus, um, and helping us to understand what, this, what it means the Word became flesh, right? Because that's the verse that came right before, is that this Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What? How is that possible? Um, and our brain can take the physical part, because John the Baptist was physically growing in Elizabeth's body sure, sure. before Jesus was growing in Mary's body. Right. Exactly right. Our right, I mean that you're, you're exactly right. The, the you know John comes before mm -hmm. uh, in in physical right. time, but he doesn't come before in terms right. of the Word who was there in the beginning. Uh, the Word made John, uh, not the other way around. That, that's a really important, a really important important thing to think about. All right, verse sixteen. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Um, so, whenever you have four, that's a grounding uh, particle, which means that it's explaining something that came before, right? Um, so it's the, and then it's also going to, in this case, also going to talk about what comes after in verse 17. Um, but for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Notice this is not the same quotation from John the Baptist. This is John the Evangelist sort of giving us a commentary on what John the Baptist is saying. So you notice that's really key there. Yeah. It's not John the Baptist talking, it's John the Evangelist breaking back in and giving a little commentary. That's, For, why, that's why the other one has the quotes around. Right, that one's why those are the quotation marks. Um, uh, and this and this one this one does not when they end there. So yeah, be really careful about that because uh, it, it kind of look it kind of feels like it just falls right into it. Um, so now again John is always trying to describe both the historical facts and the unseen forces that are working behind the scenes of all that, right? Uh, even more than the synoptics are concerned about the unseen forces, John is really concerned about that, that we see the, uh, uh, the uh, plan of God, the work of God operating behind the scenes of the historical happenings. So those are kind of the two, we think of kind of two pillars holding up John's gospel. It's the unseen forces and the historical events um, that he's trying, that he's holding up. John the Baptist is fascinating because um, his prophetic revelation, um, he sort of stands in between those two spaces of, of, of the historical uh, and the unseen, or maybe you would say the cosmological forces that are at work here. Um, so that's really, that, 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 that's, cause that, that's really important data. Um, but, you know, what do we mean by fullness is a really great question. Um, I mean, when we, when we look at, we look at a word like fullness, what, 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 do, we, what do we think that, what do we think that means? Um, um, this, this word here, uh, pleromathos, from his fullness. Uh, our, best, our best idea is to go back to verse 14, right? What does 14 say? Uh, and the word became flesh, dwelt among us, we have seen his glory, glory is the Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the fullness is grace and truth, right? Um, and then we have this we all. Um, it's all, you know, who's the all? Who's the we all? We already established earlier, if you remember, that children of God is not everybody on earth, right? Children of God is for, for John and for the Bible in general. Um, and every, every we hear someone say, we're all children of God, that's just not the case. We're all, you know, the, like the, in the Psalms, this is a constant thing that comparing the children of men who are not the good guys, right? Um, and talking about the children of God. So the we all here isn't the whole world. Um, the we all are, are, are the Christians, the, the, the true followers of Christ. Those are the ones who, as the verse tells us, um, uh, have received grace upon grace. Um, from his grace and truth, the fullness of his grace and truth, 
we have all. Remember, John's talking about himself here, right? It's, it's the it, this is the second person plural, so he's including himself in this in this group. We uh, we have received this um, grace upon grace. Now, this is a controversial thing. Um, this idea of grace upon grace. Um, there's there's two ways you could you know, this this uh, carin anti carita. So like charis is grace, right? Um, kind of like you'd like charismatic. We still have that kind of term. Um, so uh, oh, the, 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 the charismatic. Um, so grace upon grace. So modern translations will translate anti as great, or excuse me, as upon. So it has kind of a sense of uh, of an accumulation. Right? Mm -hmm. So like more and more and more grace. The problem is pretty much everywhere else we see this term auntie used, it's it's more of a replacement. It's grace in place of grace. Mm -hmm. um, now most in, most most modern translations, including the ESV, which is based a lot on the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, um, and then kind of going back in the tradition, um, all kind of are played safe and go with upon. Um, but there, you know, I I, I think um, Edward Clink's reading on this um, is is right, and I think he's he's proven this pretty pretty soundly that it's much more sincere of replacement. If John wanted to say grace upon grace, there's a perfectly good word he could have used that he uses other places. That's all over the place in the, in 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 the, in the Septuagint, the the uh, the Old Testament in Greek, but he doesn't. He uses a different word. This anti. Um, and so that's much more likely to be a replacement word. So instead of grace upon grace, the translation would be something like grace in place of grace, which is interesting, right? Because that's different. Yeah, that's that's nice. a very different that's kind so of, and much more difficult yeah. to understand. But I, I really do think it makes the most sense given what comes before um, in John the Baptist, but even more importantly, what comes after in the next verse. Um, uh, one kind of grace to another grace is the idea that it kind of fits better. So what comes next, right? What's verse 17? Um, <clears throat> grace upon grace, I think of an abundance of Lots and lots and lots of grace. grace. Right, 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 right. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that, is, that, is a, that is a possibility in, in, the, in the text, um, which has its own kind of meaning, could have its own kind of ideas connected to it, right? Um, but I think the much more likely idea um, is, is one of, uh, of a grace being uh, uh, another better grace coming, right? I see. But let's, let's, so it's, instead of it being, cause as I say, so a good grace, but then a, a better grace yeah. that comes, which, which fits well with what we have in the next verse. Uh, I think it fits better than, than and you know, these are shades of meaning. Um, Whenever we're dealing with here, but that you know, since we're looking at the Greek, it's something to talk about, right? Um, uh, and and I do think grace um, in place of grace is a better translation. So verse seventeen, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So, if grace, if this is um, grace in place of grace. Um, then we are definitely talking about some kind of contrast between Moses and Jesus, law and grace, right? Um, which which does fit well in this in this verse 17. Um, it's some kind of contrast between those things. That's built into the verse, though, right? I, I mean, we see, uh, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There's already a contrast kind of built into that verse which makes a lot more sense if the verse before is setting that contrast up. Remember, this is, this is the same thought from John. Uh, it's not like he's, you know, two, two different personalities. Um, what's interesting is the, the use of verbs. Um, so, uh, um, for the law, namos, through Moses, was given. So this is Moses, by the way. Uh, Moseos. Uh, was given. Uh, but grace and of a truth through Jesus Christ came um, is, 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 how that, is, how that, is how that's constructed. Um, so there's a difference between the was given 
and pain. Right? Those are different ways of saying something. And, and I definitely think there's something to that. Um, um, there's a difference between in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, the, the how God gave to the, to, to the Old Testament people, right? Um, he gave them the law, right? Um, when we think about how that all, you know, we, we're, you know, we're having to think on our exodus pretty hard here, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, how does all that happen? I mean, God writes in the stone. He gives to Moses. Moses takes it down to the people, right? I mean, that's a very, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a separation between God and the people, right? Uh, and some of that is because the people want it. Because the people see on the mountain smoke and flame and thunder. And they're like, we don't want to go up there. And there's a sense in which they, they're scared. I mean, rightly. I mean, it's a scary thing. Um, and, you know, some of that drives them to build that, to make that golden calf, too. Um, is fear is part of it um, as well. I mean, so we can't miss that, you know, fear can make us do stupid things as well. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff in that whole, in that whole section. I mean, the first set of law, most destroys, right? It, it, because it, it, these people aren't, aren't worthy of it. Um, but, uh, that's that's a that's so that's why you know, when he says through Moses, that's what he's talking about. The, the law had to go through him to get to the people. He was the the covenant mediator, right, of the old covenant. Um, but in the new covenant, something different is happening, right? Um, something new has been given, um, and so instead of the law coming through Moses. Grace and truth, that, that fullness, came through Jesus Christ mm -hmm. to the people God comes. It's a much, much different thing in the New Covenant than in the Old Covenant. And this is a, a monumental shift in everything. Um, rather than this law, which again, even the law, if you think about it, is, is separated from the love of God in a sense. Like, there, I mean, don't get me wrong. Our obedience to the law is how we show love to God. If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus says that. We don't want to say this is like a radical break between the God of the Old and the God of the New Testament. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. But there is still a distance between that and actually having Jesus Christ to love. Right? Having God there to love. There's a difference between having the law I'm going to follow to love him to having Christ here to love. Right? That, that's a huge difference. Um, and, and, that, and that's stressed in this, this contrast. So we, we think of, so the, the, the grace of the law, and there's, the law has, I mean, is, is a grace thing, right? Paul says that the law is a good thing. Um, it's just, that's different than having God, right? And that, that, that's different than having uh, uh, Christ in our midst, the Word incarnate there. That's, it just blows my mind. Back then, you know, they saw God, they would die. Here they have Jesus, Jesus. God incarnate, and right. they touch. Right. <laughs> right. And they do. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's, they have intimacy with God that is almost impossible to imagine, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but, you know, John is not going to shy away from that. When shying away from it would actually have been a lot, would have been much easier to convince people. Uh, it would have been much easier to convince people that God had actually become a man. Again, both for Jews and Greeks, it would have been much easier just to say he was, you know, some kind of phantom or some kind of, uh, uh, you know, Zeus come down and that that kind of idea. That can that might fit, but a regular person um, who ate and drank and slept uh, and, and was a carpenter, like, hey, why does God need to be a carpenter? Like, I mean, that, all I mean, these that, people knew. That all these people, yeah, yeah, yeah. The old yeah. Right? They all knew the Old Testament. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Saw, oh, yeah. That's all they knew. Right. And, and, and so, you know, one of the things that, you know, the, 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 you know, one of the things that John is going to be at pains to show at all, <coughs> and all of the New Testament writers are going to be at pains to show is that the Old Testament is constantly talking and pointing towards Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's, it's everywhere, um, as far as I'm concerned. Every, you know, behind every rock, there's Jesus. Uh, uh, and, you know, mm -hmm. oh, man, I, I can't believe that. Even tonight, you know, it, we, we read from the Song of Solomon, um, and the reason that's read during Easter week is because it's all throughout throughout Christian history that's been considered an allegory 
uh, about Jesus. The Psalms, like for instance, read Psalm 22. You can't read Psalm 22 and not see Jesus in Psalm 22, right? And then you can't read Psalm 23 and understand it really without Psalm 22. Uh, which is one reason why it's always, I love how our, 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 the way we read the Psalms every month, that it forces you to read 22 before you can read 23. You don't just get to skip to 23, which I love 23. Yeah. I'm all about 23. 22, I'm not, so, yeah. I'm not so sure about. I don't know about all that, all about all that. Uh, but yeah, I need 22 to get to 23. Um, you know, just like we need Good Friday to get to Easter. A great question. Because... It's because the, in the prayer book, the Psalms are from the Coverdale Psalter, which was written in the 1530s, whereas in the, uh, the King James, obviously, it's from the King James translation from 1611. So there are two different translations. They're similar, um, but Coverdale's Psalter is one of the first things, parts of the Bible, translated uh, uh, into, into, well, it's, it's, it, it works its way into the uh, uh, into the worship of, of the church. Because remember, before the prayer book service in English is, is constructed, the Psalms are, are translated. Remember, the first prayer book is 1549. So this is before even the, 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 the first prayer book service in English is Coverdale being the Coverdale Psalter. And we've had that in our prayer books ever since. It isn't until um, uh, 79 um, that any church deviated from that. Um, but the Coverdale Psalter is, 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 is a killer. It's a great, great Psalter. But in any event, uh, uh, that, that's a really interesting history. That's why it's different. It is, it is different than the King James. I don't think uh, we miss the most sport of joy for the song. Everyone loves it. Oh yeah, no, the, no, the, the, the King James Version is great. But, but you'll notice the King James Version of the Lord's Prayer is different too. You ever notice that it talks about debtors rather than trespasses? Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Oh, that's because, again, that, 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 that Lord's Prayer is a much, much older translation I mean, maybe even like you know, some people have thought it came from um, you know 15th century rather than 16th century. That was really, really, really old translation of the Lord's Prayer that just worked its way through, and we still use. Um, and uh, rather, and the King James translation never caught on um, uh, because people had said that same translation in church and in their private devotions over and over. <coughs> and it just never got on. It's one of those funny things how that works. Um, so interesting that you can walk into a, a Roman Catholic church now. And they will say the Lord's Prayer the same way we do, other than without the doxology in there, right? But they'll say the Lord's Prayer the exact same way we do, whereas their whole rest of their service is, is obviously structurally similar, but very different in terms of its language, right? Um, because people in English have been saying the Lord's Prayer that way for 600 years. It's just one of those funny things. Uh, but yeah, uh, how, how, you know, uh, language and worship is really, really interesting. Um, that, that's why those, those, those two are different. Um, no, I, 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 they both have their advantages. Uh, 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 but they're also, you know, the verses are different too, and, and they're off a little bit. So it's one of, the, one of the horrors of young lay readers, if they have to get up to read the Psalms, and instead of reading from the, from the prayer book, they go to the lectern Bible and try to read from the King James, and then everybody gets thrown off and it's a big train wreck. Uh, I've only ever seen it a couple of times, but it's bad. Uh, you got to stop because there's just no, you just can't happen. You just got to go, gotta, gotta, everybody's got to be the same page or it's, or it's a wreck. Um, but anyway, uh, that, that's the difference. So, we, 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 we're talking here about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and the difference between having a covenant mediator who is just a man and a covenant mediator who is God and man. Right. That, that's, that, that's, that's the big difference there. Because Jesus is definitely a, a, our only mediator and advocate, as we say in every single week in our, in our service. And what we mean by that is, is, is that he is it. He's, he's the last. Because to a certain extent, I mean, you know, who else would you want? Right? I mean, what, what, other, what, what other sense there? I mean, the, the Holy Spirit certainly is, you know, uh, 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 has a role in that sense of, of being a, a, a mediator but that's within the realm of, of, of the Trinity. That's within sort of the, the mission sent by. Uh, uh, Roman Catholics, they 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 they
Uh, I mean, one of the reasons it's stressed a lot in American Catholic, Roman Catholic devotion is because it's a distinctive from them and other groups. Mm -hmm. So it's a, something that's really, really focused on by certain people because it's a way of distinguishing themselves from others, right? Those kind of things can happen. Like, what's the thing that makes us different? That's the thing we're really going to press home on. Um, and so that, that, that can be the case. Um, and, you know, yeah, you know, there's some people who go fully to things like calling her, but, you know, the mediator of all graces and those kind of terms for, for Mary. And some people who are really, really into that. Um, uh, we're, we're a bit wary of that, obviously, uh, of, of all that. Um, just because it, 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 it's really hard to, to go there and not seem to take away some of the glory from, from Jesus. Mm -hmm. It seems it's, it's really difficult to do. Um, there's no reason one can't have a, uh, a devotion to, uh, uh, to, you know, to, to, to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, I mean, you know, none of the reformers had any problem in England calling her Our Lady, for instance, like Cranmer called her Our Lady. She is Our Lady. She's a, certainly Our Lady. Our Lady is an idea. Or even calling her Mother of God, calling her the Theotokos, the God Bearer. Those are all very ancient terms to talk about her. Um, you know, primarily about making sure we recognize that God is fully human. So he had to be inside of her, in her womb, as, as is explained in scripture, and that, that's plain as day. It's, it's then when we start talking about, you know, they, the, there, there's a distinction that's made within uh, Roman Catholic devotion. And again, I even hate using that term because it's so widespread between the difference between what like one person a pew believes, what a Jesuit believes, what a Dominican believes, what, I mean, all sorts of different groups that, I mean, they, they really lots of different, lots of fights in this, in this regard, what a Thomist believes, um, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, as I say, I, when we talk about them as kind of a monolithic group, it's, it's hard. Um, but it, 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 can get, it can get pretty, um, in popular usage, it can get kind of bad. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've heard uh, Roman Catholic priests talk about that you should go to Mary because um, she's kind and God is mean and angry. Um, and so you should go to her because she's nice, you know, she's, she's a nice motherly. And, the mean father of God is the one who's like, and she'll intervene between them. And, and you know, that, that's, just, that's just terrible. Uh, uh, that, that's just not, it's just untenable. You know, that's a really bad example. Uh, but that was from, from, from a priest who should have known better. But, well, I, 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 as I say, I, I, I think that's, and, and, I, and I think, I think it's, pros, it's, it's important to note too that we always leave room within our spirituality, um, within the Anglican Catholic Church, within the Anglican, the traditional Anglican Church, uh, if it, in terms of a personal, person's personal piety, if a person wants to, uh, for instance, um, use a rosary and say the Hail Mary, um, they, I'm not going to break into his house and sort of rip another hand and sort of slap him around and say, how dare you. Um, however, they, they, they're, they can be a little bit different in that regard, too. And as I say, I, I, as that in terms of that, someone's personal piety, that, that's certainly, they're, they're, they're open to them. Um, I would always argue, though, that it's much a much better idea if one's looking for a devotion um, to engage in morning and evening prayer, um, to engage um, in uh, the daily cycle of praying the Psalms, which is what Jesus did, for instance. I mean, Jesus uh, would have prayed through the Psalms all the time. Um, um, reading the scripture, um, confessing our sins, um, receiving absolution, uh, Thank the thanksgiving, giving thanks to God for He's giving us, um, and then praying for the world. I, I think that's a much better devotion than, than, than the others. Now, if someone wants to add on to that with other devotions, that, that's certainly something else. But I think if our, our first baseline has to be that, particularly as Anglicans. But the first part of the Hail Mary is basically scripture. Sure. Mary Indeed. Mary from grace, mm -hmm. the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus. Right, right. It's just reciting scripture. Sure, indeed. And, and, and as I say. And that's a I mean, I'm thankful that I, I've come to appreciate Mary mm -hmm. so much more as an Anglican. I mean, sure. because my other family members that are really not, they nail it at all. Right. They don't, it's just sort of sad. No, I think I think that's I think that's true. I mean, we, we you know you're absolutely right. I mean, I mean it's obviously a continuum. I mean, I I know uh, I I have certain uh, Baptist Presbyterian friends who would see uh, our statue of our Lord, the Bible, yeah. and Mary in our church and, and, and go, uh-oh, yeah, you, right, exactly. you, guys, you guys are up beyond the pale. Yeah. Um, whereas we would make a careful distinction about what we're talking about and why we have that. Yeah. Um, it's a way of protecting Christ's divinity and of respecting this woman chosen by 
God um, to bear to bear the Savior, and that 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 is a is a is a high calling and one we should honor. Um, and so that's and so it's it's just it's you know it, the question that becomes you know and this is a, a question that it, that people who approach the worship of God honestly can disagree on. You know, mm-hmm. how much is a devotion to Mary uh, a subtraction from right. a devotion to God? So that, that's something we can honestly disagree on. Um, but I, I would never, I think the distinction is, in our Anglican practice, we would never integrate that as part of, uh, yeah. uh, of the worship, right, of, of, of the people. I would never push that on, on anyone. Uh, and I think that's a good, I think that's a good, a good distinction um, to have. Um, but no, love Mary. She's she's fantastic. I love the Blessed Virgin Mary. Matter of fact, we're gonna have a service for her on Monday, the Annunciation. Um, this is a weird year. It's usually March 25th, but that fell on that fell on Palm Sunday, so it got knocked throughout a Holy Week. And then the seven days after Easter, it knocked it all the way down to the next Monday. So uh, this Monday we'll have the service for the Annunciation uh, of, of of Our Lady. Um, big deal. Yeah. Yes, I mean it's a, it's it's as I say it's it's you know we we have we have it's so beautiful. we have and a high devotion. Yet there's so there's a controversy about. It. Yeah, and and, it's, it's, and so, so and you know we, we kind of we, we stick with what was the consensus of uh, uh of you know of, of the early church what was the consensus of um you know uh, of, of, of you know when we talked about the fourth ecumenical council that that you know really pushed the idea for of our Deotokos as the God bearer again as to defend. The, the doctrine that we see in John about the full humanity of Christ, that's what we're really trying to defend. Um, uh, rather than, I, it, it, it can seem a bit cultish, um, what, what can kind of, what can kind of be, kind of be so yeah, we're, we're careful about that. We, we should be. Um, my cultist, my cultist. Be like Mary, not like Eve. <laughs> that, that's actually good advice. Um, well, I mean, there, there's a really beautiful, there, there are beautiful paintings of this and, con- and, and meditations on this um, that, you know, uh, that Eve does, or excuse me, that, that you know, Mary does what Eve couldn't, um, uh, that, that Mary is the one who bears um, the man Eve was trying to bear. Right? It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to, to contemplate, um, how God works and all of that. Um, um, so uh, Edward Clay puts this really well um, in talking about this progression. Um, don't think about this as uh, what he calls an antithetical parallelism, but a progressive parallelism. So when we talk about the grace, two graces, don't think of them as being in opposition to each other, but it's a progressive um, uh, uh, comparison of the two. It's the fulfillment mm-hmm. of one, right? Um, this protects us from really doing really stupid things like saying, um, you know, get rid of all that law, or becoming anti-Semitic, or anything dumb like that. Um, recognizing that, um, uh, that this is that this is a progressive parallel. Um, the old covenant is grace as much as the new covenant, right? Um, there, there, but it is in the new covenant that grace is given its ultimate and final expression, right? That that's what's that's what that's what's trying to be, be stressed here. And how could it not be? That this is it's uh, this is a, a a new and dynamic thing that's happening. Um, so, um, so the law in, in Psalm one nineteen, uh, the which is you know all, Psalm one nineteen is the longest psalm, um, and it's a meditation on the law. Right? Uh, uh, when people say, "Do Christians meditate?" Um, I always tell them, "Yes, read Psalm one nineteen. Uh, we just don't do Eastern meditation." This is a really creepy thing that kind of works its way um, into uh, into Christian spirituality. People think they got to act like Buddhist monks, so they got to like sort of clear their minds and chant mantras. No, don't ever do any of that. I I, I can't say that enough. Um, that's not how Christians meditate. We fill our souls with word and sacrament. That's how we meditate. And one way we see that is is in how meditation is described in in, in one nineteen. You know, constantly thinking about the Word of God, constantly going to it. This is 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 is, is, is instant, always going to be better for us than sort of, sort of changing meanings things over and over again. Right? Yeah, that's that 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 that's a, a, a horrible idea. Um, it has it is completely disconnected from the entire way the Bible thinks about the universe, the world, who we are, God, us. I mean, it is the the idea that you sort of clear your mind and sort of find 
the truth inside of yourself. This is a completely unchristian idea. Uh, uh, the truth is outside of us. Uh, uh, the truth enters into us through the Holy Spirit coming into us. But that's still a, something invading us, right? Um, something we need to uh, assist in our sanctification um, and walk, work with, but it's still an invasion uh, of us, of holiness into us. Um, so yeah, so no, 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 that nonsense. Um, but that's that's there's all sorts of churches doing that now. Uh, it's all over the place. It's rampant in our communities. This whole this whole this, which is surprising, but you see it all over the place. Um, but so, we're going to need um, not only the college kids, you know, the scholars the college kids. We kind of need this kind of stuff to keep us from the dangers of what's out there right now. Oh yeah, well, I mean, that that, that particular thing is it was. I mean, that was, that, that's, you know, uh, uh, when I was actually teaching at a Roman Catholic school, um, we had a, uh, a day where, where, where they did that, where they sort of, they decided that that, that was going to be their spiritual retreat. It was going to have all the students chant mantras and, uh, and stuff. Uh, uh, and, and I refused. Uh, I, I said, we're just not going to yeah. do that, right? And, and, um, and, and I almost need instruction on that. What are those um, labyrinths? Oh, the labyrinths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. scary to me, too. And, yeah, and, I mean, that, that was used somewhat in... in, in Medieval practice mm-hmm. I, again. I, I find it to be uh, uh, a, a, a add-on that that's not much value added. Yeah, uh, the only I, one I saw was the Grace Episcopal in yeah. San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that connotation. Yeah, that, 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 that's a big, that's a big thing in Episcopal churches now. Yeah, uh, yeah that, sometimes they'll design their whole um, chancel to be kind of a labyrinth kind of idea. Yeah, yeah. no, no, thank you. <laughs> As I said, there's just not much. There's not not much to that. Um, I don't think I don't think we need any of that. Um, again, again, God has revealed himself to us. Why would we not go to his revelation rather than trying to find him in some maze? I don't, I don't know. It's hard enough to find God. Um, I think it's avoiding the Bible. It's something that's a distraction. Well, I think that's, I mean, it's, I mean, I think that's the thing we find over and over again among God's people, um, is that we're seduced by other things other than what God has given us. I, and that, I mean, if you look at, you know, the Old Testament again and again, which Paul says, look there. And be afraid, you know, you know, and see what could happen to you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, you know, over and over and over again, uh, the people stray. They start yeah. worshiping idols. They go to the forest and worship the trees. They go, they go to the hill altars and make little idols and bring them into the temple. I mean, that's that's just that's just you know we're we're you know we're in we're engaged in warfare, um, yes. you know, and and we we are seduced into worshiping things other than God, um, you know. The, the human soul is an idol factory, uh, and, and we're that always the ones that the best of us who try to do, you know. And, and yeah, no, it, just it, being in this world, it's, 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 and we constantly have to be on the lookout for it, and, and constantly be, be wary of it. No, indeed, no, that, that's very much the case. Well, um, John's uh, uh, the end of John's ministry was fulfilling the prophecy. Sure. And uh, when Christ came, he was baptized with. Spirit. Right. Is that where faith was born at that point? No. I, well, I mean, I think the the, the faith of every person um, is the same throughout Scripture. So I think I think what Paul would say is the the moment when we really see uh, uh, the the justifying faith um, is in Abraham. Um, he talks about this in Romans. He talks about Abraham believed, um, and God reckoned this to him as righteousness. Uh, that's the faith. That's the same faith we see all throughout. Um, faith. The, what Paul said. This is faith in Christ. All the way, even there. It's it's faith in the fulfillment of the prophecy that from Abraham's seed the whole world will be blessed. And the way it's blessed is through Christ. So it begins even there. I mean, what we have in the baptism of Christ, um, where he says he says to John, this is to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is going through a systematic living out of being the true Israel. So when he goes off in the wilderness for forty days, it's it's it represents the forty year. Uh, of, of, of the wandering and also the 40 the 40 days of Moses but so he's living out Israel because the, there's that transition in Isaiah where it goes from talking about Israel being the one to suddenly talking about this man who's the one uh, the suffering servant the one who's going to fulfill all of this um, and do what Israel can't ultimately 
Um, and so he's a representative of Israel. I mean, he's, he's Jewish, he's born under the law, as Paul tells us. Um, this is the triumph of Israel, but it happens in Christ. And so he goes into that water um, to fulfill that, to, to live through, to live out Israel's, Israel's, Israel's uh, promise. And then the Spirit comes upon him and we hear God speak, um, the members of the Trinity, for that moment again are, 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 are there for us to see. Um, in this mission to save the world. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Um, the pleasing son is there. Does that help with the, the idea of, of that? I mean, that's, I mean, you know, the, 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 the faith that comes out of that, I mean, it's hard to imagine anyone watching that scene and, and not being moved by that. Um, but faith is hard. Uh, I mean, faith is a gift. Well, uh, please. When, when the people saw Christ, uh, Jesus, and he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, sure. uh, I just, what comes first? Seeing and believing or believing and seeing? It's a great question. <laughs> um, you know, what, what the thing that John says again and again is that seeing isn't believing. I mean, if, whenever this prologue, he says, the light came, and the darkness went eh. And who's the darkness? Humanity. We, we, I mean, over and over again, the point John's going to make is people see Christ. They see the things he does, and they go, no, I don't care. I don't want to believe. And so they come up with excuses and lies why they don't want to believe. So, I mean, you can make the argument that if Jesus came back, it was just, if Jesus hadn't appeared, in this time, if he hadn't been incarnate in this period, if he was instead incarnate in Manhattan tomorrow um, and started healing people and doing all the things he did in, 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 in Judah and Judea, would people believe? Our thought is yes, of course, everyone would suddenly believe. I can guarantee you they wouldn't. I can guarantee you they wouldn't. Um, just the same way. We would come up with lots of excuses as to why. I mean, the course of the class, oh, he's got a devil. He's only doing this because the devil's empowering him, right? Boom! You've got a great excuse why you don't, don't believe this is, this is, this is the one. Um, I mean, there's constant ones that are in there. So the seeing isn't believing. We need more than that, actually. And that's why Paul talks about faith as a gift. Yeah. That the Spirit, you know, it isn't until Pentecost that Peter, who denied Christ, can go out and give that sermon. Because it's on Pentecost when the Spirit makes a home in his heart, and he becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit, he can go out and say that. Before that, he's denying Christ to little girls who are, who are intimidating him, apparently. I love that King James calls her a damsel. I love that. <laughs> the damsel talking to him. He's like, nope, nope, I don't know that guy. And he starts cursing. and Yeah, that's because without the Spirit, he doesn't have enough faith. He doesn't have that faith. Um, he's, he's just a guy out there scared and running away. Um, that's the thing that, 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 that we have, has to hit us like a rock. Um, that, you know, that the grace that comes, that unmerited grace that comes, is, is that faith is a gift. Um, over and over and over again, that, that's going to be, be, be what we see. Um, so yeah, I wish seeing was believing. I wish, that was, I wish that was the case, but that's not the case for most people anyway. For most things, really. Um, yeah, particularly something as that means such a drastic change in one's life as Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is Lord. I mean, that, that, that means a drastic change in my life. Um, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people saw Christ risen from the dead. And, and lots of people just went, eh, nah, I don't, I don't buy it. Yeah, and that, that's, that's very human of us. Uh, I was just talking about that. Session, but we're talking about the guards. At the tomb. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. The guards at the tomb, the women were there. Right. They just, it was when they were there that the angel moved, removed the stone. Right. And so those guards heard what the angel said. Sure, sure. And so when they ran to tell the council and all that stuff, yeah. they had heard what they said. So I was thinking, it's hard. And they said, well, now tell the, tell the people this. this, this. Right. The disciples came and, moved and took them away. But they actually heard that. And I'm wondering right. how, many, how many of those guards, however many there were, I don't sure. know, that told other people. Oh, they sure. Their friends or something that it's, it's really true. Right. They saw the angel, didn't they? Right. 
right. Well, right there. No, I mean, they, 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 I mean, this is a, you know, this explains why, you know, this is one explanation. I mean, they, you know, the, the public resurrection of Christ is the only logical explanation for the birth of Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, there's no reason why any people would have started worshiping a dead Messiah. Um, there were lots of dead messiahs. Nobody started worshiping them because it was a sign that they had been defeated. And this is the reason that the Sanhedrin doesn't just stone Jesus to death like they did Stephen, right? Mm -hmm. Why do they stone Stephen and not stone Jesus? They wanted Jesus to be killed by the Romans to show that he wasn't the one who was going to overthrow the Romans. To, re to, to, to show that he had been defeated and destroyed by the Roman occupying force. This can't be the Messiah. The Romans just killed him, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so there's no reason why you would start worshiping that guy right. unless they saw unless they yeah. saw him. Yeah. You're darn right. Yeah. I and mean, that's, that's the only logical explanation for the historical record of, of, of Christianity. The reason we're sitting here, the reason we're standing here. So there, in that, in that instance, <coughs> the seeing is the believing there, right? Well, I mean, I think what we have to say is that it's um, a part of it, right? Right. I mean, when you think of like, you know, when like we're gonna we're gonna read next with the next Sunday, but Thomas uh, um, says, "I won't believe until I see Jesus." Right? So the apostles tell him, "Oh my goodness, Jesus is alive!" I'm like, "Nah, I'm good. Nah, I don't believe it." Um, he's got to see him. He's got to poke him. Right? There's that great painting by Caravaggio where he's sticking his finger in the wound. Right? He's got to touch it and see it. Um, and then Jesus says to him, "Blessed are those who believe who haven't seen." Right? Well, what does it mean to be blessed? Uh, there, uh, it means that that blessing comes from God to people, right? Um, so I, 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 you know, you know, uh, you know all, I can give people evidence all day long for the resurrection, right? Uh, that that you know, beyond any reasonable doubt, shows that this happened. But it, that doesn't mean that anyone's going to go, oh, now I'm going to come to your church every week. That is not how that conversation usually goes, right? And it's getting worse. Well, I mean, you know, but 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 the point is that you know when we when we, we make those claims um, because the Holy Spirit moves on people's heart, the Holy Spirit is what makes conversion. Our job is just to tell the truth as best we can, right? Um, so we just keep doing that over and over and over again, and then the Holy Spirit does the work, right? And then, we, but we can't be disappointed at you know, oh, geez, it didn't work this time because that's not our job. We don't get to have quotas. Like, oh, geez, I, I didn't save a thousand yeah, people right. this year. I must be a bad Christian. Um, our, our quota is, have I talked about God to my neighbors and enemies? Have I shown God's love in my life to my neighbors and enemies? That's what our job is. And that's why Paul stressed that over and over and over again. I love the part of that. Is there enough evidence to convict you as a Christian? Right, I mean, that's a great question. I, you know, in, in, in the ancient world, I mean, like, for instance, when we're reading about this, this at, at evening prayer where John is talking in Revelation about the people who are getting murdered for their faith at that time and then for the for the whole tribulation period from the you know from uh, 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 you know from 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 when Christ left to when he returns right all those people who are going to be going through through hell um, that uh, um, uh, that it's ultimately that their victory is, is secure and sure right um, but let's finish let's finish uh, uh, up up with this um, so, the law provides light for the path, grace and truth describes the nature of the light, right? Um, so the law is a light to my, light, light to, uh, light to the, to the, for the path, um, but grace and truth describe the nature of the true light, grace and truth. Again and again, we're gonna, we, 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 we hear that in the prologue. Um, so the context of verse 17 um, is, is, we're back to Exodus 34. We're back to um, where God reveals himself um, to Moses. But remember, Moses can only see the back side of his glory. God puts him in a rock and covers him um, and then passes by. And then at the end, he removes his hand. And so we can see the back side of his glory. And his whole face lights up and he, and he brings it down. Um, uh, but he, he can't see the full glory, right? Because it'll kill him. Is what God tells him. Um, uh, thus, when Moses came to the people, it wasn't just the law he brought to them. He also was a reflection of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they could see it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's in, in, you know, sort of some of it, part of it. 
uh, a reflection of the backside of something he couldn't see, right? There's still that separation. Um, but what Moses was unable to see, the argument here, what Moses is unable to see, that's what Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is that glory come to earth. So it's not just a matter of getting the reflection of the backside of a glory that you can't really see. That actual glory has come in. Um, uh, it's, it's just, it's kind of mind-boggling. It is, it is. It was it is. so glorious for Moses, he had to put the veil over because it scared the people so. Right, so that the argument John's making it's, here is, you know, yeah. who is the one greater than Moses? The one Moses worshipped. The one he couldn't totally behold. Um, Herman Rinnevoss, uh, in, his, in his theology, said, has a quote here, wonderful. What Moses saw of the revelation of Yahweh's glory, what he was able to see, was nothing other than the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Um, that that's the glory he saw, and that's the glory that's revealed in Christ. Um, that, so so it, it's, it's what Moses saw is actually, in a sense, what he even couldn't see all of, that comes in, in Christ. Um, Interestingly, this is the last occurrence of grace in the entire Gospel of John. It's fascinating to consider. Uh, from now on, whenever we think of grace, it's just connected to Christ. Because this is the first time we get his name in the whole Gospel. This is the first time he's named. Uh, this is the first time he's named. That's the name. We've been talking about him for seven, for, you know, 16 verses. And then at the end of verse 17, we finally get the name, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. Remember, Jesus Christ, Christ is Messiah, anointed one. It's not his last name, it's his title. Um, that's why you can still, that's why we'll say Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ, They're, because it's his title, it's who he is. Um, it's, it's, it's Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the anointed one. Um, you'll notice here, um, the, the Christu, this is Christ, if you've ever seen the what looks like an X and a P together, that's the the, <coughs> the, the chi, that's the chi rho, um, and that's why. Um, if, if matter of fact, it's on our it's on our pulpit, right? That's the, what looks like a P and an X. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a key and a rho, so it's actually sort of the and the R sound. So Christu uh, is is or you know, and this is the the conjugated form, but Christu. So this, the first two letters of Christ are what are that what that P and X are. Um, so it's actually a, a, a it's not really an X and a P. It's in Greek, it's a key and a row, uh, the two letters. So the first two letters of Christ. Um, oh, it's Greek. Oh, my gosh. It looks like Greek to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a great one. Yeah. Well, because it is. But uh, that's funny. That's, 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 that's one of those things that comes through. So if you ever look at the pulpit, go, why do we have a P and an X in them? <laughs> What's that about? But it's, a, it's Christ. It's a, it's a, it's a short verb, a verb, verb, version of, of Christ. So... Jesus Christ, um, yeah, um, this is Joshua, right? Uh, we call it Jesus because we basically go through the Latin into um, into English, and so. Uh, but this is the same name as Joshua from the Old Testament. Um, so it's the second Joshua, uh, which means, of course, you know, Yahweh saves. Is is is, is what, what it means. Um, so Jesus Christ came. Um, um, so the word, life, light, and unique son, the way, way it's been described, we've had word, life, light, the only begotten son, who is that? It's Jesus Christ. And then we have one more verse in the prologue, we're not going to get to it tonight, there's a plenty. Um, any questions on that? I, I, that that's uh, you know, three verses, a lot, a lot going on there. Um, uh, revealing to us who this person is. Um, John spent a lot of time, and he expects us to spend a lot of time thinking about this, and not just kind of going, yeah, 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 I get to get, it. get to the miracles, let's go. <laughs> there, there. Yeah, he wants us to really think hard about this and really get nail it down. Because um, the more we know about this, the more we know about, uh, about our Lord, uh, who he is. And John's given us a lot. He's given us a lot. And of course, you know, that's the spirit working through him. Um, this is the inspired word, right? Uh, we use inspired a lot when we mean like, you know, crazy nonsense. But it's, it's inspirited, right? Um, as, as Paul says, the, 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 
God-breathed word. Um, that's what this is. That's what we're seeing here. So, any, any questions on that? Anything at all? No, but I, I'm loving the, the study, my other study, which is the Red Sea to the Jordan, mm -hmm. and it's all that stuff. And right. We could go back over it at, at, at numbers. I mean, it's great. Yeah. Well, you, you, you know, I, I'm very much of the opinion that you, you really do have to understand, uh, you know, I, I, the, the context of the New Testament is the Old Testament. Uh, so so the, as much, you know, I tend to talk about the Old Testament a good bit when I'm talking about the New Testament, um, and it, only because it's, it's, it's the context of the authors is what they want us to see um, uh, to help us understand what's happening. Um, I mean, it's, it's, you know. God is the story. There's that thing that tells that Jesus is every single book of the Bible. Yes. I, Genesis, and, and it goes through and it shows you. Well, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I think that's, you know, that's, 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 what, John, that's what John is doing here, and right? And the saviors are not. A Christian, you know, when the Christian churches have the saviors, the Messianic mm -hmm. Jew is, they, they can bring Jesus into all that Savior stuff. I mean, he's there. They just Right, I mean, you know, it's, I, I, I think it's, you know, whenever you are involved in the Eucharist every week, um, you're involved in the Christian Seder, right? I mean, there, there's, there's, you know, even, the, uh, even Jewish scholars will look at the, the narrative of the Last Supper and say this is a replacement action. I mean, Jesus is establishing uh, a, 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 new, uh, a new thing from that old tradition. It's the fulfillment of that, um, and I, I think that's that, that's a that's a great thing to hold on to, and the great thing we should we should recognize and know um, how that's fulfilled in, in 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 Christ, how it's all fulfilled, how the entire book is about Him, and it, and that's helpful too for us to remember it's not about us, which is which is always the temptation is is to make the book about us when it's not, and if we do think that eventually it's going to disappoint us because uh, it's not about us. What, they go to the Bible and they say, I have a problem, Bible fix it. That makes it about us, not, not, not what the book's trying to do. Or they say, I believe a certain thing, Bible tell me that what I believe is true or wrong. That's not what it's, its job either. Now those things can be revealed within our study of the Bible, but the Bible is primarily a story of uh, the Trinity saving the world. Uh, now we are part of that story, but we're not the protagonist in that story. We're not the main character. This isn't a story about us where we're the hero. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that can be disturbing to people. Um, and if we go about it thinking that we're the hero of the story, um, we're actually reading a different story. Um, so this, this, can get, this can be bad where like, we've probably heard about a million sermons where things like, or, or, or like devotionals are like, be like David or be like Daniel or be like somebody in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. And and you know sometimes those can be can be can be fruitful, but most of the time it misses the point of what's happening there. Like it, this isn't the, the story of David isn't about how we can see ourselves in David and conquer our giants and conquer our challenges. That's not what that story is about at all. That's, right, right. It's, but it's all over the place. And, and so instead of saying this is a story about. The Davidic, the future Davidic king. Yeah. This is a story about the line of David. This is a story about Jesus. Yeah, I, um, I, I think books come out and all this. Oh story. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of things like that. So, so in, 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 are, 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 is that what we're, what, yeah. what, what, you know, are we trying to make the text say something it never was intended right. to say, or something that would have made no sense to the author? It's the holy scripture that they're trying to uh, commercialize, perhaps. Or so there are certainly places that are doing that. Yes, yeah. that's certainly a thing that happens. That's a big thing right now. Yeah. There are all sorts of churches it's, that are trying to find ways to sell it. It's yes. the Christianity right, the right, right. Well, it's it's but Christian. Gonna... It's Christianity as, as motivational yeah, right, speaking, right? right. right? Yeah. Like this is what's going to make you feel better right. about your life, right? right? Which don't get me wrong. There's a piece that passes all understanding within right. with, within the Word of God. But to get to that piece, there's a cross, and that's that's the part that we want to sort of just excise and throw right. away as best as we can, as often as we can. Even people who say they aren't, um, just look at how they think about Christianity, look at how they, what they talk about, what, what their focus is on, and oftentimes you'll see that that's, that's what it ends up being. Um, it ends up being very much a, a therapeutic place rather than being 
a, a place where we are uh, actually are being becoming holy. There's a difference between being right. therapeutic, therapy and so holiness. Are so, they're so concerned about the practicality of right, right, absolutely. This, that they're, yeah. they're not feeding them the word of God. Right, yes, it's, it's, it's yeah, I mean, a, a serve, you know, a, 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 the church is never going, to, should never strive for relevancy. But unfortunately, that's the catchword right yeah, now, it's everywhere. In goodness um, gracious, if it goes beyond 15, 20 minutes and half of that, they're telling a story sure, sure, that sure. has nothing, you know, it's the personal sure. thing, and then they relate it, try to relate it to the right, scripture that right. they're supposed Yeah, if I, <laughs> if I could make a confession about, about preaching, um, so, so, uh, I hate telling personal stories. Uh, I, I, I actually I, I do them, I do I do them sometimes um, only because uh, it, I, 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 it can be sometimes helpful but I absolutely hate talking about myself in a sermon um, but but I do I do end up doing it sometimes just for, for a purpose but, yeah 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 but I have to say that's, that's my, my I know my, my I'll end on this my the, the worst the worst sermon I, I heard of, uh, uh, of uh, it was a Christmas sermon I hear lots of God's sermon, but I mean, this Christmas sermon, God, 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 God help me um, in, in my own preaching. But um, in, 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 the, in the Christmas sermon um, where, uh, you know, 200 people at church and uh, we were sitting there and the purpose of the sermon was to describe God, Jesus Christ, as a blender. The thing you don't want for Christmas, but the thing you need. That's horrifying. Jesus Christ is not your blender. Yeah, right. He's not. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. He's your yeah. King. He's not your blender. So I mean, that, that's how you. But that was really cute seeing people like you know people like that kind of thing. And it and it, and it domesticates Christ. It puts him in a box, um, as as Lewis would say. The people and the priests. Oh, he's so down to earth. He's just another person. Well, that's fine. You are another human being. But you're yeah. also. A, but you know, you know what people never say that about their doctor. Yeah. Who's going to do their surgery? I really, I don't want my doctor to really know anything. I just want him to have good bedside manner. Right. I mean, you might like your doctor to have good right. bedside manner, but what you really want is for him to know what's wrong with you. Yeah. I, I don't mind my doctor being a jerk if, if he's going to make me well. <laughs> I, I want that first. I'll, I'll take the jerk who's, who's, who's knows his thing and is there to make me better, yeah. not the one who's there to make me feel better. That, that, those are not necessarily the same, same thing. Um, so maybe I need to be hurt in order to get better. Like we're totally fine with that in the medical field, but but in, but in in terms of churches, we're not fine. We don't want don't want to be hurt, even though we we actually really need that oftentimes, oh, yeah. be, because we need to be told about who we are. So that's that's a that's a bit of a digression, yeah. and uh, but uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's true. I'm gonna 